Hello and welcome to the Cisco CSIE security training. This provided to you by Nitil Sharma Simplified Learning. This is the first lecture or introduction for day one of the first module Cisco ASA Firewall. I hope you find this useful and very informative. Let's begin. First of all, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Mohamed Jalal Gritli. I live in Tripoli, Libya, and I'm working as a senior network security engineer at a company known as Yamam Information Technology. I also work as a technical instructor. I am Cisco CCAI certified academy instructor, and I firmly used to be a teacher for web development for PHP, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Also, I'm currently working as a CSIE instructor and mentor with Nitha Sharma. The certification I currently possess are cert uh, CCIE security. My five magical number is 66102. And I also have a CCMP enterprise, formerly known as Rotting Switching. And I have Cisco CyberOps Associate. Also, Fortinet NSC4 professional and 321 as a complementary. My hobbies are scripting. I love writing codes in uh, PHP, Python, and Bash. Also, I love reading about information technology on a daily basis. So enough about me, let's begin the lecture. Now, this is day one of the first module ASA firewall. I'll give you an introduction and a brief about the Cisco ASA and how does it come to life, how does it work, on an overview. Before we can start talking about the firewall, let's ask a very important question about today's attacks. Now, who are the hackers who are trying to break into our networks? That's a very important question. Today's attacks are randomly coming according to reports only um, ninety percent of attacks are considered to be randomly targeted, so most of the times you are not being targeted specifically. Most of the times, more attacks are coming randomly to networks, which makes targeting people very, very like. Only ten percent are targeted attacks and having an ATP or advanced persistent threat. Sorry, APT which means we need to think about securing networks because we're not targeted all the time. Most attacks are randomly coming. In this case, and as a result, organization need to protect their confidential data. They need a firewall to secure access to their network. That's why we can protect ourselves from the automated attacks. And network security engineer must protect their valuable assets and resources within the network. And those resources can be anything confidential or critical to the corporate information, being healthcare, patient information, working, database, or any other thing without being tampered or altered and dealing with data breaches and security deals. As a result, this information are defined in the security world as a security domain, which makes us divide our corporate into two separate parts. The first part is known as the trusted world, the trusted domain. The second one are the untrusted domain. So a security domain are the assets and the corporate information and resources that need to be protected. That's what we call trusted. We call this as a trusted, be not because it's 100% secure, no. Because anything by default doesn't have any security implemented. I mean, think about it. Having a Cisco router or a switch, it doesn't come secured by default. You as a network engineer have to secure it and configure all the security policies and rules to secure the access to the inside of the network. That's why we consider the inside of our network as a trusted, 
because we ourselves have put some security measures into it. While we cannot control outside or the other world, that's why we consider it to be as untrusted. So in this case, the trusted portion of a network are known to be our security domain. So everything inside our security domain is protected from anything outside of the security domain. And the most effective way to provide security to the, um, our security domain is by placing a firewall at the boundary level or at the parameter level. Let me explain. So in this case, we have our security domain. And we have the other part of the world, which we call the scary internet. Or internet. And we need to separate these two worlds by placing a firewall at the parameter level or the edge of our network to help us separate the untrusted from the trusted world. So that's the untrusted. That's my trusted world. Only by this case, having a firewall will protect the company assets from the unwanted traffic. So let's have a basic idea. What are the two goals of a firewall? Why do we need a firewall? I mean, think about this. We have a firewall. We need some access to the outside world. We can't be closed upon ourselves. We need some access. We need to access the internet. So we have some traffic that needs to go out to the internet. That's fine. But in some cases, we have some resources that we want to publish out to the internet. We have some web servers maybe, for instance. I have a web server here. That needs to be accessed by outside. So in this case, having a firewall will give access only to the resources that I want published but not to the inside organization. So that's goal number one. So we need to create a barrier between the untrusted pieces of, of, of softwares, which are outside public internet, and our public web servers that they have some information, it resides in a private network, someone needs to access our web servers to make purchases or sales or have a look at our company. So the basic idea is having a gateway or a machine on the outside, they need to access our inside. And that thing is the gateway who decides whether the traffic should be allowed or denied. That is the firewall. So firewall is just a metaphor. It's not literally something on fire. Let's have an, an example. Let's assume that we have a building. Let's assume that we have a building. Hold on, let me grab my pen. So let's say we have a building. That building surely contains multiple rooms, right? Let's assume these are the rooms. The basic idea of a firewall is to have precautionary measures and contain the damage. For example, if this room got caught on fire, if fire goes here, having the boundaries doesn't let the fire go out to the other rooms. We need to contaminate the damage and don't let other parts of my house catch fire. That is the main target of a firewall. To do this, we need to separate our company resources into multiple zones. So having multiple zones is separating the company resources and assets. Just um, similarly for what I've drawn before as having one building and multiple rooms, the firewall separates the, ac the assets into multiple zones. 
in this case, if a fire got caught in one zone, it doesn't go and corrupt the other zones. Okay, so a firewall is intended to control the access from one zone to another one. So just to give a definition, a network firewall is a system or a group of systems. They can, we can have multiple firewalls for increased throughput and redundancy, which we'll discuss later. They're used to control access between two or more networks, a trusted network and untrusted networks. Now, how does a firewall work? A firewall work based on pre-configured rules or filters. And let's have a quick example. Let's assume that we have a company, a building, multiple floors, like floor one, two, three, four, and five. And we have so many employees working here. That's Bob. This is Alice. And as an organization, surely there is a security gate. And we have a security guard working here. He knows everyone in the company. He doesn't memorize them, but everyone who works the company have an ID, right? With their picture, smiley faces, and their name. That's an ID. Anyone who wants to come into the organization, they need to show their ID identify themselves and then, then they can get, get access. That's fine. But let's assume that outside of this organization, there is a coffee shop. Starbucks. No, 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 no ads or whatsoever. So, and let's give a quick recap. So if someone works in my company, Bob wants to go and grab a cup of coffee. Now let's build this first scenario. Bob is going out, leaving the security gate and going to grab a cup of coffee. Now first question, will the security guard stop Bob from going to the, uh, the coffee shop and grabbing coffee? No, because there is no need to forbid someone who works at my organization to leave the company. That's totally normal. However, when Bob grabs a cup of coffee and he's coming back. Now, will the security guard stop him? Of course not. He will not stop him because Bob surely has an ID card and he knows that Bob works at this um, corporate and he should be allowed in. That's fine. So that's scenario number one. Now, scenario number two is for someone who doesn't work at the company. Let's assume this is me, that's MJ Gricky. So I'm going to the corporate, I'll come to the gate. Now, will the security guard stop me? Of course, I don't have an ID card, I don't work at this company, the security guard doesn't know me in person, so I must not be, be allowed in because there is no need for me to, 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 to be allowed in. Now that's scenario number one in the outside world. Let's have scenario number two. What if I'm a visitor and I have a meeting with Alice who works at the fourth floor? Well, in this case, I'll have to tell the security guard, I have a meeting with Alice, please allow me in. So the security guard will have to check with Alice. He will call Alice, hey dear Alice, someone here with the name of MJ Gritley is going to visit you, is coming to visit you. Is he allowed in? Shall I allow him in? Alice confirms I'll be allowed to access only the fourth floor because I'm coming to visit Alice. My, I, my card, which I get, my temporary card, should not allow me to access the fifth floor, third floor, second or first, because I'm only coming to visit Alice who works on the fifth floor. In this simple example, this organization is my trusted world. Me, as an outsider coming from the untrusted world. And the security guard is the firewall. Firewall has pre-configured rules. If you work here, you're allowed in. If you go out and you're coming back, you're allowed in. 
If you're coming from outside, you should not be allowed in unless you have a specific instruction from someone in, then you should be allowed. So, firewalls also can be hardware, like physical boxes, or they can be software. Now think about the today's transformation into virtualization technologies like VMware, Proxmox, or Hyper-V, or um, Zentil, or whatever. Even virtual machines can send traffic and they can also be protected so we can place a firewall as a physical box or also it could be emulated as a virtual machine. Also, if you think about your Windows or Mac OS or Linux operating systems, also, they might have built-in firewalls as software running inside of this machine to further give them uh, protection. A firewall can be a single device or multiple devices. A router can be a firewall as well. We can configure a router as a zone-based firewall, which we will learn later in the segment. Or we can grab multiple routers or firewalls to, uh, to protect the networks for increase of throughput or redundancy. It can be a single host, it can be multiple hosts or multiple devices running firewalls. It could be a virtual device or a physical device. Anything that can provide the firewall capability can be combined. Firewalls are greatly various in designs. We can have multiple design approaches, multiple functionalities, multiple architectures of firewalls, and they come in various shapes and costs. As for the design, I'll give you two simple design ideas for the firewall and for the rest we will discuss later on when we deep dive into firewall implementation. But a simple implementation for the firewall can be behind the customer edge router. So that's your customer edge router facing the internet. And we can place the firewall over here before the company assets. In other organizations, they might have a different approach for implementation. We might place the firewall facing the internet. Then we might have a router, then we could have the company network. Or we could place a firewall without a router behind the company network and facing the internet. So there we have three different scenarios of implementation, but there are more which we will discuss later on. So, as I said, a firewall works based on the concept of security levels. But, just to give you a brief of how a firewall thinks, let's have this quick discussion. As a comparison between a router and a firewall. So think about this. How does a router work? A router works based on its routing table. So, a router has two interfaces or more, and it can route traffic if the distant network is present in the routing table of the router. But, a major difference is, by default, all traffic is permitted. And if you want to deny some traffic, you have to write some rules or known as ACLs to deny traffic. So a router doesn't have any pre-configured rules. Everything is allowed as long as it's reachable and routable. A firewall thinks in a different approach. A firewall has a concept that it works based upon. So let me just give you um, a quick information which I will change later on. This is not 100% accurate, but let's assume that access from the outside to the inside of our networks. I'm only discussing out end, okay? Is denied by default.
And if you want to allow the traffic from outside inside, you will have to write an access list to allow. Just if you want to override or make an exception. So unlike the router, traffic from outside inside is always denied. And it's based upon you as an engineer to write the access list to allow the traffic from outside inside. But that's not the full picture. A firewall works based on the concept known as the security level, or Cisco ASA to be specific. And as I said it before, to give you an explanation of the security levels, let's assume that we have zones, okay? So firewall can have multiple zones, inside zone, which have the private and trusted portion of the network, outside zone, which connects to the internet or the public internet, and there might be another zone, which is the DMZ, which we'll come back to later on. So let's think about only two zones. The pre-security rules say, whenever you're going from a higher security level to a lower security level, traffic is trusted. If you're going from low to high, traffic is not trusted. Let's explain. A firewall works as similar to water. Now I know what you're thinking, what's the relation between a firewall and water? So a water is similar to a waterfall. A waterfall works like this. Water falls from high to low portion of the ground. This is the high portion, that's the low portion. This is earth, okay? This is earth. Water always falls from the higher point to the lower point. That's how a water falls. Whatever we trust, this is our trusted zone. And we give it a number. That's our security level. So 100 is the security level of my inside zone if you want to say. Zero is the security level of the outside world, which I don't trust. Now let me ask you this. Let's think about traffic. If a traffic is going from high to low, from inside, outside, by default, water falls like that. So it will be allowed by default. So if you're going from high to low to the internet, traffic is allowed because you're going from trusted to untrusted, that's fine. But if someone from the outside tries to access our network, a water can never go from low to high. A water doesn't climb up, only goes down. So from low to high, it's denied. Because you're going from zero to 100, which is, doesn't make sense. But it's only allowed in one exception. If you, as an engineer, write some access control list to allow the traffic to go from low to high, which comes in uh, different scenarios. So a security level is just a number that we assign to our zone to assign its trust level. Each interface on a firewall must have a security level or a zone. And based on how big or small this number is, these are the pre-configured rules of a firewall. But what is this DMZ? Why do we have a third zone or a DMZ? Well, um, do you remember the use case of a house and having multiple rooms and each room has a door to separate itself from the other rooms? Think in this way, if a fire got caught in one portion of a building, we must contaminate the damage and doesn't let it go outside to other rooms. That's the use case of zones. Because think about this scenario. If I have a firewall, that's my outside, that's my inside. I trust this portion 100%. I don't trust this portion anything. No, zero, that's internet. 
and let's have a web server over here and let's assume I make an access list to the given exception just to allow traffic to go from outside to my web server now let's assume that a hacker was able to bypass the security measures on the web server and my web server is now hacked or compromised. What's happening now? Now a hacker is sitting here and he's able to access my inside network and also steal data. And because high to low is always denied, then the hacker will be able to extract information and leak or have a data breach. So this is not a secure way to um, gain access to web server or to give access to web server. On the other hand, let's assume that we don't place the web server on the inside. Let's assume that I place the web server in another zone, the DMZ zone, the demilitarized zone, the area with no weapons. And I give this zone a lower security level than 100, but it's bigger than zero, now let's apply the rules high to low is allowed low to high is denied let's think about this let's say i made an access control list on my outside allowing traffic to go to my web server now let's think a hacker trying to access my web server traffic from 0 to 50 is not allowed by default but we made an exception we made a hole on the firewall so traffic is allowed, which is fine. Can my inside server access the the uh, the DMZ net network? Of course, traffic is going from 100 to 50, high to low, so it's allowed by default with no rules to be configured by the admin. Can the inside network go to the internet? Yes, 100 to zero, high to low is allowed by default, which is cool. Now for hacker trying to access my web server, if my web server got compromised, if someone hacked my web server, can they access my inside network? No, low to high is denied by default. So even if my web server got compromised, the hacker cannot access or um, gain access to my corporate network because the rule says low to high is denied, 50 to 100 doesn't give you access. That's why we need a third zone known as DMZ just to contaminate the damage if my web servers got compromised. So that's the main goal of a DMZ. A DMZ doesn't give you access to everything. You only get access to a specific portion of the servers while the important critical information are placed inside so even if the web servers or the other servers publicly accessed got compromised, you do not have access to the network because low to high 50 to 100 doesn't give you access by default. So these are the pre-configured rules of a firewall. However, let's look into the firewall history and how did it come to life so we can build uh, upon this for further information. So all the time I was saying firewall, firewall. Now I'll be specific since we're discussing with Cisco ASA. So I'll be talking about Cisco ASA. ASA or known as the Adaptive Security Appliance. The adaptive, sorry, so the adaptive security appliance. That's the firewall for Cisco company. It was released since 2005. A great firewall, good one, everyone loves it, it's been in production since. However, before Cisco got the ASA, they had another firewall known as PIX. But then they moved to ASA, which was working well. The Cisco ASA is similar to a router working on layer three and layer four. So 
it can filter based on IP and ports. However, same year, 2005, someone named uh, Nir Zok founded a company known as Palo Alto. Uh, Nirzok was a former engineer of uh, Checkpoint. He was working with Checkpoint. But in 2005, he founded the company Palo Alto. And in 2007, Palo Alto released a firewall, their first firewall, awesome firewall. Let's have it, PA firewall. Palo Alto firewall. This firewall was something different. It was different than the Cisco ASA because the Palo Alto firewall was running on the level of layer seven. Later in the segment, this firewall was named to be the next generation firewall. This title was assigned to Palo Alto firewall by another company whose name is Gartner. Gartner is a, 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 a statistics company who gives titles and rates products based on uh, customers' ratings and company visions and achievements. Gartner named Palo Alto's firewall as the world's first next generation firewall because it can work on the base of layer seven. It also has IPS, Intrusion Prevention System. It can filter based on application, URL filtering, antivirus, malwares. It has so many features. Let's explain this. Cisco ASA works only on layer three and layer four. But what are these layers? I trust that you know that Packets are electrical bits going into network devices. They have different names based on different locations. So on the layer two, it's known as frame. On the layer three, it's called packet. On the layer four, it's known as segment. It also could be called PDU or datagram. Unit. And so this is layer four, and the rest is layer seven, and here comes your data. Cisco firewall could only work at this level. It couldn't filter based on layer seven, based on data, based on URLs, HTTP requests, or content of the data. So the market share for Cisco ASA firewall was going down because Palo Alto started going up. They have a firewall that works at layer three and four, also works at layer seven by design. Cisco was going down, their market share was, they were losing market share because of this. So up until, up until 2013, Cisco's market share for firewall was going down. However, in 2013, Cisco made a change. And to understand this change, let me first give you a brief. The Cisco ASA has different models, okay? Cisco ASA has different models. These models were named as 5500. Let's have a look. Let's go ahead and say firewall models. You see, 5505, 5510, 5520, 25, 40, 50, and so on. If you look at the images, these are the images of the ASA firewall. 
you see? 0, 5, 10, 20, there is 25 as well, there is 55, uh, 40, 55, 50. They have different models based on uh, the throughput. However, this fireball has an engine known as Lena. So layer 3 and 4, they have an engine known as Lena engine. Linux over A, say. This Lena engine was capable of running layer 3 and layer 4 inspection. Now, firewalls are mainly two types. They can be, uh, firewalls can be stateful or stateless. And they can be stateful. A stateless is something which is legacy. It's an old days firewall that's no longer in use. And firewalls can also be stateful. Now let's go to the first example I gave you about the uh, organization having a security gate and they have a coffee shop. When someone from the company goes out to the security, to the coffee shop, when he's allowed in, a firewall allows him in because firewall is intelligent. How intelligent it is? It's intelligent because if you think about a hub, sorry, let me change colors. So let me ask, what's the difference between a hub and a switch? Who is intelligent? Of course, a switch is intelligent. A hub works on layer one, it's an electronic, electric device. It works based on electronic. So it doesn't think, it only forwards traffic to all ports, it doesn't think. A switch is intelligent because a switch learns something. What does a switch learn? It learns MAC addresses. Similarly, a router forwards traffic based on IP only, but a firewall learns something, learns connections. Think in this way. That's my organization. That's my security guard. Someone goes out to the coffee shop. When someone goes in from inside outside to the coffee shop, when he comes back, the firewall learned in the first place that my employee went out so he made a connection table. So the return traffic is normally allowed in. So even when we go from the inside through firewall to the outside, when we go outside, the firewall remembers that someone or 10111 is going to Google's 8.8.8.8. .8 so when the return traffic from 888 to my private IP or public IP for my inside network is dynamically allowed in because firewall learned and built the connection table. While in the case of stateless firewalls, the return traffic is not allowed in and you have to manually allow it by writing X control list. So that's the big difference between stateful and stateless firewalls. And the Lena engine is a stateful firewall, but it only does inspection for layer three and layer four. It doesn't work in layer seven. So let's go back to the story. I know it's a long one, but please enjoy it with me. It's, it's very useful to, to learn how firewall or next gen firewall came to life. So Palo Alto firewall since 2007 was working in layer seven. It could inspect layer seven. In 2013, Cisco acquired a company known as Sourcefire. Why did they acquire Sourcefire? Because Sourcefire has a product known as Snort. Snort was written by Martin Rowish. I forgot the spelling, let's check this out. Snort was developed by Martin Roesch in 1998. 
and Snort belongs to a company known as Sourcefire. So Sourcefire, they own Snort. And Snort is a very, very good IDS and IPS engine, intrusion prevention system. In other words, it can detect attacks and it can inspect the layer, the packets up to layer seven. So by purchasing, by purchasing Snort, Cisco was able to look at layer seven. So what happened? Cisco tried so much to integrate the Lina with the Snort. And the result was fail. They failed, they couldn't make this work until they realized they need to change hardware. So they changed the hardware and they were able to finally rebuild uh, a firewall, another ASA, Fit 500, that can run Lina plus Snort. And they call it 5500X. Let's have a look. So when I showed you the five R models, there is one shot that was naming the X module. I missed that one intentionally because the X means that we have snort now. We can control based on layer three, four, and layer seven. So that's how the module X came to life. And the modules are variable. So we have 5506 for the X, I mean. Uh, we have 08, we have 12, 16, and so on and so forth. The 12 and 16 X are the ones you'll be working or facing when you have your Cisco CSI exam. However, the story doesn't end over here. Palo Alto, since they're doing good and they have been working with layer seven since 2007, they found a loophole on the new model of Cisco ASA 5500X. And they have a bad implementation because Cisco's ASA 5500X has one loophole. To work with Lina, you had to work with CLI. And to use Snort, you have another GUI. So you had two different interfaces, a command line as a graphical interface combined to give you the X module or X series of ASA. While Palo Alto, they said, we have one box, all features, layer seven, and one GUI. While ASA had two, two UIs, command line and GUI, which made Cisco also lose market share. Now, of course, I'm not talking about the recent uh, implementation of Cisco's uh, firewall, uh, the, the layer seven. I was talking about the uh, year 2014 and 15 and beyond. So Cisco was losing market share again because they couldn't get similar approach as, as, Fire, as uh, Palo Alto. Because they have two IP addresses, one for Lina, one for Snore, two different interfaces. Until they tried integrating them and finally they came up with a new operating system, a new hardware. It's known as Firepower. Also known as FTD. They made a new operating system, new engine. It's known as FXOS. Firepower Extensible Operating System. They were finally able to merge the Lena engine and the Snort engine to work as one, and they released their Firepower Threat Defense. That's the new Cisco FTD of Firepower Threat Defense. One device, one interface, works at layer seven, everyone's happy. Not quite much. 
because Palo Alto also came up with a concept. They were also watching Tisco, so they had a defense. What they said was, so we had previously, in 2007, we have PA firewall that works in layer 7, and it has one GUI. Since 2013 onwards, Cisco, or sorry, just to sum up, 2005, Cisco only had ASA. It only works in layer 3 and 4. 2013 and beyond, Cisco had 5500X, which can work in Lina in layer 3, 4, and 7, but they had two UIs, CLI plus GUI. Palo Alto was doing this since 2007. Finally, Cisco released their FTD. They say we have all features now, layer 7 and one GUI, which Palo Alto was doing since 2007. Then Palo Alto said we have another concept. What if you have multiple firewalls to manage? Multiple locations. Let's assume we have a location in Tripoli, in Bangalore, in Dubai, in LA, or any other part of the world. Still, you'll have to use different UIs, different GUIs for the Cisco world. All boxes, one GUI for each box. You have to manage each box individually. Palo Alto has a solution known as Panorama View. So with Panorama View, you can manage multiple locations when the single interface. So Cisco was falling behind until Cisco finally released their solution FMC, the Firepower Management Center, which allows you to, con to control or manage multiple boxes, multiple locations from a single interface. So all this time, Cisco was falling behind to catch up what Palo Alto has been doing since 2007. However, this is just a history of the firewall and how does it work and how did we come to life with the next gen firewall, which we will discuss in the fourth module. I hope you have enjoyed this session and you've learned how a firewall works and how does it think and the pre-configured rules and the secret of the security levels behind the Cisco ASA. This is an introduction to firewall. In the next lectures, we will go with labbing and deep dive into configuration and real life implementation and discussing the ins and outs of the Cisco ASA as the first module. I hope you found this session informative. I hope to see you in the next one. See ya.